Let's hear it for the United States Marines singing our praise song. Isn't that wonderful? Great job. They can do it. We can do it. Listen to this. Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It's he who made us, and we are his. For his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures, how long? Forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's stand together and sing to that kind of God. God's Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Can we do that together? Words are Holy Spirit rain now. Holy Spirit rain. Love the 
Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Second verse, I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. Come on, let's sing it. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Come on, Jake. Let's make some belief statements together. Can we do that this morning? Clap your hands on that one. You got a chip on on this one. Everybody singing and clapping along this morning. Here we go. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you a people of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Second verse. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. I want to sing the chorus. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. How many of you are thankful for that power in God this morning? Here we go. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in my giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. Blood of the Lamb in the. Pre- 
precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Let's give God the glory this morning. Amen. Please join me in prayer this morning. God, we are just so thankful for another opportunity that you've given us to get ourselves out of bed and get ourselves ready for what this day holds for us. And Lord, we're thankful for the acknowledgement this morning that you've given us. Another opportunity to allow, as we've gathered in your name, to take a moment to, to sing praises to you. And Lord, it's our hope and our prayer that um, what we have just sung is just an expression of the life that you've called us to live. God, we long for your Holy Spirit. God, we long for your Holy Spirit to rain down on us. Lord, if there's a moment here this morning, could we continue just to present ourselves saying, God, forgive us for times where we thought we've been able to do things on our own. Forgive us when our attention has been drawn to other things and other stuff that this world has to offer. God, forgive us when we've put ourselves before you. And Lord, we trust that you will Allow us as a body of believers this morning to experience your presence in such a new way. God, that you would bring a sense of refreshing and renewal. God, that you would allow through again the raining down of your Holy Spirit to completely restore, completely wash, to bring an uplifting. In doing so, God, we we again, we long to give you praise. God, we think about the love that you have given to us, and, and Lord, we are thankful that we've had an opportunity to respond to that, and we, as we've said, we've gathered today to proclaim the depth and the width of your love. We're going to get a chance as we interact with each other, but as those who will get a chance to watch things digitally this morning, Maybe there's someone for the first time that needs to know about your love. Lord, we're thankful for the work that you are doing. For how you are drawing your creation back to itself. And Lord, we're so aware of the reality of the turmoil that is in our world right now. God, we need your help. You've heard our prayers. We're tired of dealing with this COVID. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ this morning that you would continue to erase that and eliminate that from our society. And then, God, we think about the strength that comes in your blood. How you willingly laid down your life, allowed your blood to be shed for me. So, Lord, we continue to praise you. We continue to thank you. We continue to, again, surrender our lives before you. And we ask that as a church, that you would continue to place before us your will and your direction, your vision. We want to accomplish something beyond ourselves. And we trust this morning that as the word of God is spoken to us, as you speak to us, God, we find ourselves so willing so hungry and so thankful for what it does, how it changes, how it encourages, how it strengthens, and how it heals. And God, we're just going to continue to praise you in all these things. And we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. We're going to enjoy a video right now of the life of the church.
morning, Heritage. This is Pastor Justin with your Church Life Updates for the coming week. First of all, I wanted to say welcome to those of you who are new here. We are glad that you're here, and if you haven't done so yet, please be sure to stop by the I'm New table in the foyer. We have a gift for you just as a thanks for being here with us. Uh, we are pleased also to announce that we are so glad that for both Sunday services, we are wide open ministry-wise as far as having nursery, kids, and something for adults available for both services. So you can come with your entire family, and there will be something for every single one of you. Next month, hopefully, mid-March, we're going to be opening up uh, Wednesday night services again for adults. Uh, it'll be a, an elective format. We'll have probably three different electives to choose from, and that'll be starting up on Wednesday evenings, and nursery will also be available for that as well. So Wednesday evenings, the entire family can come and there'll be something for everyone um, from babies all the way through adults. Also, don't forget uh, our connection cards are back and we're asking everyone at least once in the next few weeks to fill those out uh, just so we can get some updated information on you guys. Um, lots of email addresses, phone numbers, physical addresses have changed. So we're just trying to have the most up-to-date database as possible. So if you could please fill out our connection card and you can put those in the bowls as you leave here today. Second service, okay? We didn't want you to miss it this morning. This is just for you alone. He's an example of all the wonderful, faithful people we have in this congregation. And so just keep it quiet. He's teaching the fifth and sixth grade class right now. We're going to hit him really hard. Second service, okay? Hello? Hey! It does work. All right. Uh, I believe there's a Miss Betty here this morning that also had a birthday this week. So we, again, appreciate you as well. And um, thank you again for all that you do as well. So as we approach our scripture this morning, I'm reading out of Luke chapter 23. And we'll start reading in verse 32. And just as a context, this is a part of the crucifixion narrative. And so as we approach the word of God, it says this. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals. One, is, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. 
And the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. We invite those that are willing and able, if you want to stand and sing with us this morning, please feel free to do that. Father, we thank you this morning for the honor of singing a song like that and living a life like the one you've called us to live. So thank you for that. Help us to hear you 
as you speak to us through your amazing word this morning. We appreciate your goodness to us. We appreciate your kindness. And ask you to speak to us now in Christ's amazing name. All the people said, great to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of this time together. By the way, two quick things. Um, take the little card. Just one time during the next five weeks, we want to have everybody who's attending church right now to fill out the little kind of connection card. We really need to get a better grip on our database around here to know who's a part of our church, who's attending the church, uh, who we need to kind of be reaching out to. So just one time during the next five weeks, fill out the card, drop it in the uh, plates as you leave uh, this morning, and uh, and give us your information. A lot We're finding a lot of information. As we're making calls to the congregation, we're finding out that many of the Folks have changed phone numbers, changed addresses, and so this would help us greatly. So please do this if you're here, and we'll move on from there. One other thing, I just want to give you a word of congratulation and thanks. I just want to let you know how much I appreciate the fact that throughout the course of these times of adjustment and complication and church shutdowns and church startups and church changes, you guys have been wonderfully gracious and cooperative and thoughtful and Christian in the way you've handled it. So would you please give yourself a round of applause and all the rest of the people here for what you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The words come to us from um, Scripture this morning. John was reading uh, in Luke chapter 23. There was written a notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. From this verse we take the series title leading up to Easter, The King's Speech. The things that Jesus said from the cross. We're talking today about the word of forgiveness. Have you ever thought about what uh, have you ever thought about what others might say about you after you're gone? Ever thought about that? Do you care? Does it make any difference to you? Somebody says, I don't really care what they say after I'm gone. I'm interested in what they're saying right now. Uh, but you know, I oftentimes wonder what are people going to think of me once I'm gone? As a matter of fact, would would people possibly appreciate me even more after I leave? After I'm gone. Sometimes that happens. You ever, you, ever, you ever had that experience? I've held many, many, many funerals. And at virtually every funeral I've attended or served at or helped to lead, I thought, I wish I would have known all this stuff about this person before this. There was so much I did not know about them. And so it helps to, to realize that it's important what we say about each other and how we speak about one another. Or if you have time and opportunity, what would you like to say as some of your final words? in this season of your life? What would you like to have the time to say to other people? I think those are important thoughts. Now, we may never get the chance to say anything before we're gone from this planet. So just in case, it's good to think about what you might want to say to other people now and get it said before that time arrives. Does that make sense? So last words, final words, important words are a big deal. Now, the, the gospel is amazing in this sense. When I say the gospel, I'm saying the, math, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are amazing in one particular sense I want to mention this morning. For, for one thing, if you combine all the information of all four gospels about the last, the word in your note-taking guide is the last week of Christ's life, the last week of Christ's life occupies roughly one-third of all the content of the gospels. I think that's amazing. Now, let's take it one step further. If you go to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, 33% of the content of that book is dedicated to the final 24 hours of Jesus. I think it's astounding. One third of the entire book to the last full day of the life of Christ. Now, what, what do those statistics suggest to us? What do they say to us? What might they suggest? I think one of the things, obviously, that you're thinking about as well is that what happened the last seven days of the life of Christ has utmost importance, right? If their focus in the Gospels on the last seven days, and then John focuses seven chapters on, on so 24 hours, what they're trying to say is this is really the ultimate significance of what I'm writing right here. And that's exactly what we're talking about the next several weeks is what happened the last 24 hours of Christ's life. The King's speech, King Jesus' speech, was delivered from a very unusual pulpit. His pulpit was not something like this. It wasn't a music stand. It wasn't a big table. It wasn't any of the fancy things we oftentimes use on platforms. The pulpit Jesus used in this case was a cross. He spoke from a cross. 
The Bible records seven statements of Christ from the cross. Now, I want to I want to say this. We're going to do a little bit of speculation today, so hang in there with me and don't panic if I say some things you haven't heard before, uh, or if I do. But um, it's possible that Jesus said more things from the cross than we have here. It's possible because we certainly know that that uh, the entire life of Jesus' ministry was not captured in Scripture. As a matter of fact, the the scholars say that that roughly a total of 52 days of Christ's life on earth are captured in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 52 days. Month and a half. So there's certainly a lot more that was said and done than happened than we know, okay? We know this much right here. But we do have these seven statements. If he said more, fine. But these are the seven we focus on. Matthew and Mark have just one of his statements from the cross. It's the same one. So Matthew and Mark both share a single statement of Jesus from this pulpit. Luke has three, and John has three. And each of the three is different in those two books. So we focus today on Luke chapter 23, verses 34, verse 34, this statement. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Or as the King James says it rather cryptically, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That's the statement we focus on today. That's the part of the King's speech we want to focus on this morning. Now, you know, we're used to hearing that phrase, and we've repeated it ourselves, and we've probably said it in responsive readings in church, or we've read it in the Bible how many times, and yet here are some questions I have. When it says, Father, when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, who is the them? Who are them? That's a good question. And my, my question is, why, why, did, why did not Jesus forgive them? He says, Father, forgive them. He's the one being crucified. Wouldn't he be the one to do the forgiving? Doesn't that make sense? Does and here's one. Does does God forgive people because of their ignorance? Is there a past because of ignorance? And we're going to look at these in a minute, but these are fascinating questions, and all of them rise from this statement. These are not hard questions to come up with. They may be tougher to answer, but let's take a look at some of these. He begins with, Father, Father, forgive them. Now, why, why again, it strikes me as strange that it isn't Jesus saying, I forgive them. Right? He's the one being crucified. Why does he say, I forgive you all? Why does he say, Father, forgive them? I think one answer might be found elsewhere in Scripture from the psalmist. I think it's because, in part, the Father God is the one that all sin offends, finally. God the Father is the one who is offended for all sin. Look at Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4. The psalm writer says, For I know my transgressions, my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. We believe this is David writing this psalm. And you know, I have to say, as I read this from the, from the writings of David, I think, Against you and you only have I sinned? I mean, how about, how about Bathsheba's husband? I mean, haven't you sinned against a few other people in your life, dude? No, but he's actually saying something quite profound and important. No matter who it is that we sin against, ultimately we have sinned against somebody God loves. Ultimately all sin is an offense to God. So Jesus says, forgive them. Father, you forgive them. Ultimately, what they're doing is against you. Jesus constantly points to the Father as the source and the object of our faith and worship. You know, even though we are, it's interesting, um, in my years of life and ministry and going to church and leading church, you have, you have God Christians, you have Jesus Christians, you have Holy Spirit Christians. You're aware of that, aren't you? Our Pentecostal and Charismatic brothers and sisters are our Holy Spirit people, all right? Got lots of friends in all of them. I'm fine with this. 
um, my Lutheran friends and, and even my Catholic friends, and they're, they're God people. But us evangelical Christians like us, we are Jesus people, right? Well, the good news is <laughs> we're all safe. We're all safe. But, but the fact is, even though we as Jesus people are constantly referring to Jesus, which is wonderful, keep in mind Jesus was constantly referring to the Father. So it's okay. You're not going mainstream. You're not going high church to talk about God the Father. All right? Jesus points us that way. Jesus reminds us that the Father is the source and the object of our faith and worship. He reminds us that there is one who always hears us. There is one who always hears us. And Jesus demonstrates that in this amazing statement. Under life stresses and afflictions, Jesus was suffering grievously. Jesus was in an incredibly physical, psychological, spiritual, stressful moment of his life. Even during those times, prayer is his, listen, first response. You know, oftentimes we, we in life say, you know, well, we've tried everything else. We might as well pray. <laughs> Jesus says, quit waiting so long. First response is to pray. Forgiveness. Father, forgive them. Forgiveness may be some of our most important unfinished business in life. Because situations in life can lie buried. They're not always on the surface. Resentments can simmer. Things eat away at us in time over the course of our life and oftentimes shift the direction, mood, and attitudes of our life. That's why forgiveness is so important. Fanny Crosby, the great gospel hymn writer, has in her song, Rescue the Perishing, which we normally only sing during missionary times, unfortunate. Listen to what she says in the third verse of the song, Rescue the Perishing. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, Feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Isn't that amazing? Talk about an in-depth understanding of human nature and the depth of the grace of God. Maybe forgiveness is that most important ongoing thing we can keep learning how to do and do and do again. You say, how many times do I need to forgive somebody that keeps offending me? What did Jesus say? Yeah, yeah, do the math a lot of times. He says, just keep on, keep on forgiving. We'll tell you why later on. Keep on forgiving them. And then this is, this is you know, I've, a lot of this stuff I've never noticed until getting ready for the sermon today. <laughs> i got to tell you this. You know, the, the part that came to me was this. Maybe intercession. You know what intercession is? I talked about last week. Intercession is praying for somebody else, praying on somebody else's behalf, praying for them or on their behalf. Intercession. Guess what Jesus is doing right here? He is interceding. This is an example of intercessory prayer, which says to us maybe intercession has a... And if Jesus did it, and if he meant it, and if it made any difference, what's your answer to all those? I, I mean, mine is, yeah, yeah, yeah. If he did it, and if it had power and meaning, maybe we should consider how much more power intercession has than we ever imagined. Maybe praying for other people, and maybe, listen, maybe praying on their behalf has more power than we ever dreamed. You say, where do you get that idea? Right here. You see it? Jesus is doing it. And everything Jesus did was an amazing example to us. Everything. So he says, Father, forgive them. Well, them who? Who was he forgiving? You ever thought about that? But was, he, was he simply forgiving the people uh, that literally pounded the, the spikes into his hands? Was he literally forgiving those who actually did the deed? 
Was he forgiving the one who gave the, the green light to do it? Was he forgiving Pilate? Was he forgiving Herod? Was he forgiving the Caesar of the day? Was he forgiving the ones who actually crucified him? Was he forgiving his disciples for abandoning him and just staying at distance at times? Was, was he forgiving? Was he forgiving? Was he forgiving everybody who shouted, crucify him? I, I don't know, but I think maybe the answer is yes, 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 and yes. What do you think? Do you think his forgiveness was wide enough to take care of that? And here's the other amazing thing about this. Kind of like the thing last week, we talked about the disciples, this this rough and tumble rogue band of secular dudes who were his tw first 12 followers. Some of them doubters. Some of them uh, betrayed him. Others were rousing and jousting and wrestling during the, 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 la the Last Supper. And, and the point there was, if those guys can be disciples of Jesus, anybody can, which is great news. Here's some other great news from this first statement of the cross. Here it is. If they can be forgiven... If they can be forgiven, if they can be forgiven, so can we. And so can the worst example of humanity that you know. You with me? Be forgiven. And all the people said, Amen. That's great news. Father, forgive them. This is the grace of God at work. You know, we have stories, you know, I come from the same background you do, as I've mentioned before, maybe some of you online, but, but um, you know, all of us can remember stories of the evangelists who came and the pastors who said, you know, told the story about the person who resisted God and finally said no for the last time, and the Holy Spirit of God never visited them again. I want to encourage you with a word. I wouldn't ever give up on the Holy Spirit being able to reach a person if I were you. I know the stories were powerful in getting us to come forward. I get that. I know what they were for. But I don't think we should ever give up on the Holy Spirit reaching a person. Ever. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not. Now it gets interesting here. For they know not. Is there a special grace for ignorance or lack of awareness of Jesus? a good question. Uh, sometimes I try to do a very uncomfortable thing. I try to put myself in the place of God and say, how would I respond? You ever done that? That's the only time it's safe to act like God. Don't ever tell anybody you're doing it. <laughs> Just do it and ask your questions and keep it to yourself, okay? So, but, but I've asked my question, if, if I were God, how would I respond to this, that, and the other? And we've had conversations about that in Bible college, I remember, and you know, what if we don't make it to the, to the foreign lands and give them the word of Jesus? But, but it's, it's a valid question. What, what does God do with the people who never heard, never had a chance? The name of Jesus never came to their ears. And, and ironically, you, depending on which version of Protestantism or Catholicism you, you've been a part of, there's different answers for all of that. But I, but I would take you to John chapter 9, one of, one of uh, the encounters Jesus had with, uh, with some people. In John chapter 9, this is a pretty fascinating piece of scripture. In John 9, there's a guy who was, who was born blind, who got healed. And, uh, and, and they asked the guy the question about Jesus. You know, uh, how did this happen? What's going on? What? You know, what, what did he do to you? And the man said, hey, look, all I know is once I was blind, now I can see. They thought he was smart-mouthing him, so they tossed him out of the temple. Jesus heard it says they threw him out, and, and when, he, when, when, they, when he found them, he, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you've now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have committed this world so that the blind will see and those who 
will see become blind. Wow. Some Pharisees who were who were with him heard him say that. And they said, what, are we, are we blind too? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. For they know not. Is there grace for those who never knew, never heard, who lived their life as best they could? How deep and how wide is the grace and love and forgiveness of God? That's a part of the question. How far does it reach and to whom? To whom? The fact is, I don't think we know the answers to those questions. Completely. Our theologies would suggest we don't know. But one thing that is important to say is, for those of us who have heard, who are hearing, who are listening, who have grown up as we have, take no chances. Do what is right and best to do. And make your choice to follow the one who's really worth following. That's the route to take. The assurance we have comes from the faith we take, from the love of God that he gives and the love that we share, from the obedience that we offer to him and the witnesses of his spirit, the word, and the works. Now think about this. There are some who know not what they do. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There's an interesting switch of that little phrase that intrigues me. There are those who know not what they do, but there are some of us who do not what we know. My concern for the Christian world today, my concern for the church, is not so much about the first part that we know not what we do because we pretty much know what we're doing in life. My concern is that we sometimes do not what we know. So what is there in our lives? What is there among us that we know to do? As Jesus would talk, the Gospels talk about, and we don't do it. That's, that's my concern. Where, where is my spiritual knowledge ahead of my life and my lips? That's the question for Christians. Where is my spiritual life way ahead of my life and my lips? What is there that I know to do and do it not? That's the challenge to people like, I think, you and I. And then he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. And and a simple question to that one is, well, what if we don't forgive? What if I don't? What happens if I don't forgive somebody? Somebody once said, matter of fact, it was the pastor to be of a great church in Louisville, Kentucky. He said in this illustration one Sunday morning, resentment and unforgiveness, you've heard something like this, I'm sure. Resentment and unforgiveness is something like setting yourself on fire and hoping the smoke will bother your enemy. It just isn't worth it. Resentment, unforgiveness, isn't worth it. Did you know that you can actually forgive a person without their, here's the word for your note-taking guy, permission. Did you know that? Here's some some enjoyable things about forgiveness. You can forgive a person without their permission. That's good news. Because sometimes you, you might, you know, it's tempting for us sometimes to say, you know, I just want to let you know that for that offense of you, for what you said to me, I forgive you. You what? I don't need your forgiveness. You know, not everybody is receptive to that. You understand that, right? Not everybody is willing to buy into our forgiveness for their sins or their offense. And so sometimes forgiveness has to come without a person's permission. And yet it's, it's one of life's greatest liberating forces for us. Because forgiveness is actually compelling. And listen, forgiveness is contagious. Other people figure it out, learn about it. It's contagious. Forgiveness. 
has amazing power. In a word, last week we mentioned it. In a word, forgiveness means, the word is, release. To forgive means to begin the process. It doesn't always happen the first time. It doesn't always happen by saying it. It doesn't always happen in a moment for us. God can forgive in a split moment, not us, a lot of times. The deeper the offense was, the more pain it caused, the more collateral damage that was experienced. Usually, the more of a process forgiveness is. But forgiveness is releasing a person to God. Let God be their judge and jury. Let God take care of those things. Let God make final decisions. And it's to release myself from all of those internal chaotic feelings and release myself to God that His Spirit can help my spirit learn how to settle down and find peace. That's a part of the power of forgiveness. It is to release another to God, release myself to God, and find His peace in the process of all of that. I want to tell you a story about Betty and Charlie. Betty and Charlie were successful, popular, attractive business people in the town where we were for some years. I had heard they were having marriage problems. The community was kind of worried they had marriage problems. And one day Betty showed up at my office, sat down, and just said, you know, I'm not sure that I can keep this marriage together any longer. I said, Betty, what's, what's going on? She said, he's been with too many other women. I, I, can't, I can't tolerate this any longer. Do you want a divorce? No, it's going to wreck our family. It's, it's a terrible situation, but I just, I can't stand it. I said, have you, have you ever considered trying to forgive Charlie? She looked at me and said, I can't. I can't. I was frankly in water over my head. I was in my mid-twenties, trying to figure out how to respond to this deep life stuff. And I simply asked the question, Betty, are you saying you can't or you won't? She looked at me. She thought for a moment. And then she asked a powerfully important question. She said, well, then what is forgiveness? And boy, was I, was the pressure on. I thought, I've never been in that situation, never been close to it, never want to be. What do I say to a woman in that situation when she just simply asks the question, what does it mean to forgive? And it was virtually in that moment that God helped me to realize you are not made to be judge, jury, and hangman. You have to release this stuff to God. And that's essentially what I said to her. Their situation never got completely healed as far as I know. But in my heart, I finally figured out a bit more about what forgiveness really was. The deeper it goes, the more difficult it is. Sometimes the longer it takes to come to a point where you've not only forgiven them, but you hold it against them no more. It's finished. And so on this first amazing statement from the cross of the king's speech, it's one for the ages, one for the entire world, one for the past, one for the present. It's a speech for the future. It says everything we need to hear and experience. What's amazing is that as Jesus Christ here was suffering unimaginable torture and degradation and pain, as he was suffering incredibly from a human standpoint and a spiritual standpoint, Jesus nonetheless delivered at least seven of the most amazing statements that speak to human needs, human hopes, human desires, human solutions, and salvation from this amazing pulpit. There has never been a speech more eloquent, more powerful, more needed than what Jesus Christ said from the cross. And he begins it, or at least we begin it, with the word 
of forgiveness. May praise and glory be to God for what he has done in Jesus Christ. Let's stand together for a moment. The speech said everything we need to hear. We are his audience. One of the enjoyable things that you do with the Bible is put yourself in the setting. Put yourself in the place. Put yourself at the cross. Put yourself in the conversation. Put yourself around the table at that first communion. We'll be having communion next Sunday morning. Put yourself around the table. Put yourself in front of him as he utters those amazing words. Father, forgive them. They have no clue what they are doing. And would you please allow yourself in this moment, for this day, for this day forward, to please be the audience. We are the audience. He is speaking to us. Have you allowed him to do that kind of work in your life? Will you allow Christ to intercede for you in your times of difficulty and struggle? Will you dare step forward during this time and say more than ever before, you know, I've made, I've taken stabs at it, I've taken a poke or two at being a follower of Christ, and yet I kind of bounce back and forth a little bit. I hear things that I can't quite figure out, don't have answers to, and it kind of throws me off. You know what? The best way to be a Christian is dive in wholeheartedly. Just start believing that you're serving a good God who really cares and gave us Christ. Dive in and then figure out what to do with all the questions that you have in the days to come. But start with a serious investment of your whole being in him. Father, we take a moment to simply let you speak to us. The place our hands can touch right now is the most important altar we'll ever have. That thing inside of us we call our heart, our mind, or the seat of decision-making is the altar at which we bow this morning. And ask that you would just invade our lives in powerful ways. Thank you for this amazing speech of King Jesus. Thank you for the cross. It's a pulpit that never stops speaking to us. For that we give you thanks. And Father, just for a moment here, we'd like to come to you together and pray as a congregation. So folks, on the wall behind us or your note-taking guide, wherever you find it, look at that prayer. And let's just pray it together, please. Here we go. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your amazing grace and your patience with us. Thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, who gave it all for our, for our sins and forgiveness and freedom. Help us open our hearts to receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord for today and forever. Amen. May God help us to let that be who we are and how we live. Go in his strength and peace and take delight in this day. And all the people said, amen. God bless you. Say hi to a few people around you, and uh, let's have a wonderful day together.